Good morning. We celebrate today as if it were Pentecost, delighting in the coming of the Holy Spirit, who gave birth to the church and, knew, and who now comes alongside us as we advocate, revealing Christ and transforming and empowering us through his abiding presence. Let us open worship today with our responsive call to worship. We come to join with all the earth in praise. We praise the Lord with joyful noises, joining the symphony of the earth. On this Sabbath day of rest and gladness, please stand if you're able. Let's join in voice for hymn number 40, To God Be the Glory. There is nothing that can separate us from God's love. Therefore, let's confess our sins, trusting that God will forgive us and help us to transform our lives. Let us acknowledge our sins, first as a congregation with a printed prayer of confession, and then silently, individually. Tender God, forgive us for our half-hearted faith that loves only when it's easy and reaches out only to those who are like us, that ignores your less convenient commandments and fails to bear fruit anyone would rejoice in. How can a faith like that conquer the world? Nourish us again, awesome with wholehearted faith that abides in your love 
and shines forth with joy. Through the grace of Jesus Christ, we pray. Now let us silently confess to the Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. The only one who can judge us calls us friends. Jesus chose us over his own life. So let us choose Jesus in the life we have now. By the power of the Spirit, our sins are washed away and we are made new. Let us live as God's forever children. Alleluia. Amen. Our peace comes from knowing how much God loves us in Jesus Christ. With God's help, we try to love and forgive one another as Christ loves and forgives us. The peace of Christ be with you. Let us greet one another with the peace of Christ. How are you today? Holy Spirit, help us hear familiar words with fresh ears and to take your holy word seriously as a guide and pattern for our lives. Amen. So our scripture is going to be Matthew 28, 16 through 20 today, but I'm going to be reading it throughout the message along with lots more scripture. So I hope you had your coffee this morning because we're going to go through a lot today. So last time I was here, we talked about Jesus' death and resurrection, and then on that same day of resurrection, later in the evening on Sunday, there were two people walking on the road, one named Cleopas, and they were headed to a village named Emmaus. And so we're not quite sure where Emmaus was located. The Bible says seven-mile walk from Jerusalem. So if you take a look at the map, they have four places for villages that they thought could be Emmaus and the seven miles in the Bible could have meant seven miles out and then seven miles back or maybe it could mean seven miles round trip because the people that were walking did it all in one day so they went out and then they came back so 14 miles in one day would have been a lot but we're not quite sure so if they went Um, If they went this halfway out, it would have been about an hour and a half walk, and then halfway back would be another hour and a half walk. If they went the full seven miles out, it would probably have been about three and a half hours. So just to kind of think about how far they were walking, where they were walking, they were walking west of Jerusalem. And it would have been a lot to do, and 14 miles would have been a lot to do in one day, but maybe that's what they did. So regardless of the setting, we're going to set that aside and we're going to read uh, what was happening here. So it's here on this road that Jesus came near and began walking with these two people, but they were prevented from recognizing him. The travelers started to recap all that had happened in the past few days in Jerusalem concerning Jesus. In Luke 24, 25 through 27, Jesus replies, and he said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. So just think about walking on a path for three and a half hours to maybe an hour and a half and walking with Jesus and they didn't even know it was him. And so speaker and podcaster Stephanie Brazell, who she's coming to the Knox Lady Seminar this year, she went and visited 
Israel in July, and she was trying to find the road to Emmaus. And she was she drove around the countryside, and unfortunately, because Israel has things built on top of things and layers and layers on top of each other, she could not find the road that she was looking for. But one place was uh, covered in pine trees. And so it had pine and cedar trees, and she said, just imagine the most beautiful Bible study ever taught, walking through a lush forest. An hour and a half to three hours, pleasantly walking downhill, listening to Jesus reveal the scriptures to them. Jesus didn't have to do this. He could have sent an angel to reveal the scriptures, but he didn't. This teaches us his meekness, which is strength under control, and humility of God and the glory to come. So again, we don't know the exact road, but I was looking up some artist renditions, and these are just some, some artwork that I found, and a lot of them did have the trees covering the path. So I thought that was interesting to think about uh, the, the best Bible study ever happening on that road. Continuing in the book of Luke, it says, As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he was going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? Now moving to the book of John. It says the disciples were gathered together Sunday evening with the doors locked because they feared the Jews. Then Jesus stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. John 20, 20 says, after Jesus said this, he showed them his hands in his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the father has sent me, I am sending you. Thomas had not been in the room at this time, but a week later, Jesus came to Thomas and said, put your finger here and look at my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Don't be faithless, but believe. Thomas responded to him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. And then after this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. So the Sea of Tiberias is also the Sea of Galilee. And if you look at the next map, there's the Sea of Galilee and Tiberias is there near the center. And so that's where they would have been. John 21, 2 through 14 says, Simon Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we will go with you. So they went out, got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you had any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul in the net because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord! As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and he jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from the shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it <clears throat> and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. And after this, on the beach, the Lord asked Simon three times, Do you love me? And Simon replies, Yes, I love you. Jesus said, Feed my sheep. 
Simon had denied Jesus three times, and Jesus here restores Peter, giving him three opportunities to affirm his love for the Lord. So it's on the spot at the Sea of Galilee. The next picture will show you. So the Sea of Galilee is there on the side, and then this is the spot where they think that Jesus restored Peter on the beach. But this is also the spot where Jesus fed the multitudes with two fish and five loaves of bread on the hillside. So again, Israel is a very small place. All of these things happened in very close areas of each other. So, and this is actually a significant place for two different reasons. So now we're going to go to the next slide, and this is the Great Commission. So this is Mount Arable, and this is the mountain where they think that the Great Commission happened. And you can see the Sea of Galilee is just off in the distance there. So standing on top of the mountain, you can look out into the lake. I'm going to read Matthew 28, 16 through 20. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So again, this is where they think the Great Commission happened. And now we're going to move into Luke. Luke 24, 50 through 53 writes about Jesus' ascension. Luke writes, Then Jesus led the disciples out to the vicinity of Bethany, and lifting his hands, he blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he left them and was carried up into heaven. After worshiping him, they returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and they were continually in the temple praising God. So the Bible says that they were in the vicinity of Bethany. And the next picture is going to show, this is the traditional spot where they think the ascension happened. It's on the Mount of Olives. Uh, the Bible does say Bethany, but Mount of Olives was on the way to Bethany. Uh, so there's a little chapel here. And like I said, it's the traditional spot where they think that the ascension happened. Another account of the ascension is also written in Acts 1.8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So Jesus remained on the earth 40 days after his resurrection. He visited over 500 people. In Jewish tradition, the number 40 often symbolizes the fulfillment of a promise or the accomplishment of God's purposes. So this is just another place in Israel. I think I had shown it to you before. So we're on Mount Carmel here, and there's a monastery on top of the mountain, and there's an outlook at the top of the monastery. And so you just look out into Israel, and if you see on the one side, there's little arrows that point. And this one was pointing to Nazareth, so we were looking out at Nazareth. But then everywhere you looked, there was another place in Israel. So there was Samaria and Judea, and they just had arrows pointed to where all the things were happening. And is there one video there, Dane, or not? So I just thought it was so awesome looking out to all of these different places that are mentioned in the Bible. And there were a lot of people standing up there. I really wished I could have gotten a picture of all the signs pointing everywhere, but it was crowded up there, so I didn't get that. But I think the next slide is also some more views from the top of Mount Carmel. Now I'm going to read Acts 1, 9 through 11. After Jesus had said this, he was taken up as the disciples were watching, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, they were gazing into heaven, and suddenly two men in white clothes stood by them, and they said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up into heaven? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come in the same way that you have seen him going into heaven. Then the disciples returned to Jerusalem in a room upstairs where they were staying. So Christian tradition says it's the same upper room that the disciples had the Last Supper with Jesus. So this was the upper room that I showed you before. Again, this is not the first century 
uh, upper room, but it has been rebuilt. And again, the Bible does not specifically say it was this spot, but this is the traditional spot that they think the disciples stayed. During this time, they were continually united in prayer. In a Bible study called The Unexplainable Life, it's a Bible study on the book of Acts, Erica Wiggenhorn writes, The two messengers, the angels, were clear. Jesus was going to return in the same way he left. It wasn't going to be some secret event that they could miss. It was going to be plain as day. Now they were going to go and wait, as he had said. And I'm sure the disciples were racking their brains trying to remember all that Jesus had told them about the Holy Spirit. I'm sure they argued and debated with one another over what they remembered. But they obeyed. They went back to the room and they waited. Erica says, I find it beautiful that they prayed during this time of waiting. It was 10 days of continual prayer as this ragtag bunch sought God with everything they had. Erica also writes, God's timing has a very distinct purpose. His reasons for making us wait are far beyond our ability to comprehend. To be candid, I am not a big fan of being in God's waiting room. We are all waiting for something, a medical diagnosis, a paycheck to arrive, a promotion to be announced, a relationship to be restored, a prodigal to return, a heart to mend, a healing to occur. We're in the waiting room for the first time or the hundredth time, and we're here for a reason. Be still and listen intently to God today. He's getting ready to call your name. Keep praying, keep connecting with other believers. He is up to something, and that is a promise. So now for 10 days following the ascension, the disciples and the other followers of Jesus have remained in prayer. And now it is the Jewish holiday, the Feast of Weeks. And I'm going to read Acts 2, 1 through 4. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So Erica Wiggenhorn writes from her own imagination here. Let's picture this scene. The disciples were gathering together celebrating the Feast of Weeks. Most likely, Peter is reading Ezekiel, which is what would have, have been done during this holiday. Peter reads out loud to them, As I looked up, behold, a stormy wind came out of the north. And suddenly, Philip shouts out, Wait, did you guys hear something? Is there a storm kicking up? Peter dismisses him and continues reading Ezekiel. And a great cloud with brightness around it and fire flashing forth continually. James and Andrew chime in. No, Peter, look! Flames of fire are approaching. Look up! Thomas begins laughing and shaking his head. Here we go again. Jesus is going to do something to totally freak me out. Peter sits dumbfounded. It's Ezekiel's vision. It's happening before our eyes. Peter quickly scans through the rest of the text. Son of man, I send you to the people of Israel, to the nations of rebels who have rebelled against me. And suddenly, Peter is using a Coptic dialect. John is speaking Latin, and Andrew is speaking Greek. What is going on? All the other disciples are speaking in languages too. Peter knows they must act. He reads the next section while trying to take in the scene at the same time. And you shall speak my words to them, whether they hear or refuse to hear. God gave the disciples the Holy Spirit so they could speak to the people. We're told in Ezekiel 3, 8 through 9, that God would strengthen the apostles to withstand any opposition that they might face in their mission. So now I'm going to read Acts 2, 5 through 8. Now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hear them in our own native language? 
So the disciples may have been in the upper room, and then maybe they started walking closer to the temple at this point, or maybe they were the whole way to the temple and sitting on the southern steps. So if you flip back, I think, two pictures to the southern steps. So again, these were the steps that ascended to the temple. Some people think that this is where Pentecost happened because there was a very large crowd gathering and they were able to speak very loudly to everyone. And so um, many people think that Pentecost happened on the southern steps. Peter stood up and raised his voice and started boldly preaching to the crowd. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were convinced of the truths about Jesus and convicted of their sins. What should we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. About 3,000 people were baptized that day. The Holy Spirit radically transformed these people. They were scared and hiding just days before, and now the disciples are preaching to thousands of people about Jesus in the open, unafraid. Pastor Jason Hunter at First Baptist Church of Clarion, he had a message on the Holy Spirit not too long ago, and he said, take the away, because the Holy Spirit is a person, not an it. Holy Spirit was intended to be a comfort for disciples who were getting ready to face the most difficult times in their lives. We experience Holy Spirit most vividly in extremely difficult times. Jason Hunter also talked about a pastor, Francis Chan, who was interviewing a captive Korean missionary. And after this missionary was freed, he said, I would rather be back there in captivity by terrorists because of the intimacy I had there with Jesus. So what does this mean for us? I know that I would not sign up to be in captivity by terrorists. This was a really bold, unimaginable statement. Erica Wiggenhorn writes, If we want to truly be led by the Holy Spirit, we have to know the Word of God. I truly believe that one of the primary reasons we don't see or feel the Holy Spirit working in our lives is because we have not committed ourselves to knowing God through His Word. By, neglect, by neglecting the Bible, we not only grieve the Holy Spirit, we stifle His ability to speak to us. And there are statistics that say that if you read the Bible four or more times a week, that that is when it starts to becoming life-changing. And I can say for me personally, I do great reading the Bible when I have to come up here. <laughs> and so days before, I'm reading and studying and doing all the things, but on a day-to-day -day basis, I would much rather read a short little devotion or pull a verse out from somewhere or listen to a sermon message when I'm driving in the car. But this is not what changes our life. We have to read God's word, and we have to do what it says. Let us be the people who others look at and see an unexplainable life changed by the word of God through Jesus. And let us be filled with Holy Spirit. Amen. So now we're going to watch the next video, and it's going to give us a little recap of all the places we visited today. I believe in God the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead and ascended into heaven, where he sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, 
the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Does anyone have any praises or concerns for today? All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for sending the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, we would be striving to do everything on our own. As we gather around today, celebrating the coming of your Holy Spirit, we thank you for your beautiful multicultural family. We thank you for our friends and our family and our church, and we lift up the people mentioned today, and also those that are in our hearts. Please hold them close and give them strength and courage and fill them with your spirit. Revive us, sanctify us, unite us and fill us once again. Forgive our many sins and set our hearts on fire with the good news of your gospel. And now let us pray as Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now for the prayer of dedication. Generous God, we bring you our offerings today and ask that you bless them. Bless the money in the plates that it might be saved, stewarded, and spent in ways that honor you. Bless the tasks we will undertake this week that we might be co-workers in your coming kingdom. Bless the hours of our week that our lives may be our offering to you. Bless us to be blessings in this world. Amen. And now hymn 350, Open my eyes that I may see. <laughs> 